this fantastic. Okay, I found this on the web for she read this book that is supposed to be like this fantastic. Check it out. But I swear, no pages were harmed in the reading of this book. I need a new word for runners up. So much of this is based in fact of what fact that was an emphasis. You know, I'm a super, super duper, super duper fan of <laughs> Lisa Jewell. What am I, six? Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to some more 2023 year end content. So today we are gonna talk about a stack of books that absolutely loved reading this year, but have not quite slotted into my top favorites of the year, which we're going to talk about in a subsequent video. So stay tuned for that. But if you guys have been following me on Instagram, you will have noticed that I have posted best backlist books, best of 2023, like debut and new to me, repeat authors, because there's just, I always want to like shout out my love for so many books and so many authors this year. But today we're going to talk about kind of like my runners up books of the year. So while I absolutely loved, loved, loved these books, the Decision Fatigue Libra in me had a really hard time creating like a top 15, which is kind of where I landed. And what I'm really trying to avoid doing, as I mentioned in my 2023 wrap up or like, like my year in review, is I'm trying not to dump like four videos and 40 books and these are all my favorites and that kind of a thing. So we're going to talk about some books that absolutely impacted me, that authors I'm going to read more from, and I'm going to try not to get into too much detail in every single book. So knowing me, grab a drink, get comfy, and let's talk about some of some of some of some of some of some fantastic books that I read in 2023. Okay, now not planned, but most of these are 2023 releases, which again, if you guys have been following along with my journey at year end, then you would know 55% of the books I read this year were 2023 releases. And I didn't used to track that, but my gut tells me that's a big increase from years past. And I just was drawn to so many new books, whether they were new to me authors or like favorite authors of mine who had new books coming out. So anyway, it shouldn't be a surprise that that's what's happening here. So the first book I want to talk about is The Last Word by Taylor Adams. This was sent to me by Tandem Literary and William Morrow. And I am just such a huge super fan of his. And this is just, I would say, typical Taylor Adams in that page turning breakneck, breakneck pace like anything is possible. It is banana pants. It is crazy town it is off the rails and it is such a delightful read. So this is about a woman who is house sitting in a very isolated place with just her and her dog and her closest neighbor is like a quarter of a mile away, I think. And she can see him. They both have telescopes. They kind of connect that way, but she's basically all on her own. And one of the things she does is she downloads a whole bunch of books online and she reads this book that is supposed to be like this fantastic okay i found this on the web for she read this book that is supposed to be like this fantastic check it out okay my siri just went nuts when i was talking right now and i have absolutely no idea why my computer is flipped open but anyway so she winds up downloading this book from this horror writer and she reads it and she hates it and she leaves a one-star review about this book and the writer of the book starts to engage with her online, telling her she needs to take the review down and this negative review is impacting his livelihood. And long story short, she doesn't take it down. And then really weird, strange, bad things start to happen. So we get two POVs. It's so deliciously dark and messed up. And I mean, just go in with like expectations, not expectations, with suspend some disbelief. I guess I want to say if you've read a Taylor Adams book, it is in the very same vein, but so just deliciously fun. And as a reader and a reviewer and an aspiring writer, I feel like I connected in so many parts in this in like the scariest of ways, but I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And not a spoiler to say because he has said it online and in other places, the dog is fine. The dog is fine. So if you are worried about that, the dog is fine. Okay, next book is A Flaw in the Design. This is by Nathan Oates. This is a new release. And this is kind of like a very dark, diabolical book. And I read the premise of it and I was absolutely gripped from the start. So in this one, we also have another writer, which I don't think is necessarily a theme here, but we have a writer. And his sister and her husband wind up dying in a car crash. 
So he and his wife and their daughter live in Vermont, small town. He is a professor at college there. And after his sister dies, he winds up taking custody of their 17 year old son. So his nephew used to live in Manhattan, sort of a very rich Upper East Side kind of a life. So him moving to Vermont is a huge change for him. And there's something kind of dark and diabolical about his nephew. So we start to see things unfold. And as Matthew is living with them, he starts attending classes at the university. And it's like he's charming and he's sweet and he's heartbroken over what happened to his parents. But there's also an innate darkness to him. And we start to wonder if Gil, who is our main character, is seeing things that aren't there. Is Matthew who he thinks he is? Is he projecting things? There were some incidents in the past that we see in some past timeline POVs that have clouded Gil's judgment about his nephew. So very much a lot of questions about what's happening here. But we go from Vermont to Manhattan, again, some multiple timelines. And I just loved the deep darkness of this book. I really enjoyed the writing. I enjoyed the setting. You know, I love anything about a writer. And Matthew is an absolutely fantastically interesting character. So I had a great time with this and I'm excited to see more of what Nathan Oates does. Another binge book is The Housemaid by Frieda McFadden. This was the first of her books that I read and like so many other people, I just binged it big time. I loved all the twists and turns in this. I also loved the dark and messed up -edness of it. I had some reminiscence, reminiscence, it reminded me in some ways of another book, but I really liked, not in a copycat kind of a way, but in a similar ideas kind of a way, but I liked the route that Frieda McFadden went with her characters, and I liked where this ended. So I have not yet picked up The Handmaid's Se the Housemaid Secret. I keep calling it The Handmaid. The Housemaid's Secret, which is the second book. I do own it. I have heard it's not as fantastic as this, but I also feel like when you read a book like this, there was a part of me that didn't want to read them immediately back to back because I have had personal experiences where I have back to back read books in a series and been much harsher on the second one because I felt like the first one was so fantastic and hard to meet. So I plan to read it in 2024, but I really just like the darkness of this. So it is a woman who comes to live with this family on Long Island and take care of their daughter and take care of their house. And the Winchesters are kind of a very interesting family. So our main character has some darkness in her life and she's got some secrets to keep and she winds up just finding all sorts of things when she starts to work at this house. So what we do know on page one is that the police are at the house and something has happened and then we go back in time to find out all the what's and the why's and the how's and the who's and it's great. So something bingeable, that's totally the one. A sequel that I did read, which I not intentionally didn't read it sooner, I just didn't get that far, is The Family Remains by Lisa Jewell. So this is the sequel to The Family Upstairs and I loved that book so much. Again, if you guys have been following me for a while, you know I'm a super, super duper, super duper fan of Lisa Jewell. What am I, six? I'm a super fan of Lisa Jewell. And in so many ways, for me, this is like very hard to compare to the first one. So we do have some continuing story. We have some new story. We have some new characters. We have some old familiar characters. And the, ha the Family Remains was never meant to be like turned into a series in any kind of way but there were so many I think fans that wanted more and she really loved those characters so she wound up writing a book too so I would say I loved it as much as The Family Remains but in a different way because there were characters in this that we explored more that we didn't spend as much time with in book number one and then also we got some new characters so there is some police investigation going on here we have one of our characters go from London to Chicago, so we get some Chicago time, which was kind of fun. I have a very sentimental attachment to Chicago from back in the day, but I really just love her writing. I love her characters. I love how she tied so many things back to book one. And again, book one is a one and done. So while well, there is a door open at the end of book number one, I think it was meant to be more of an ambiguous ending in that kind of a way to give you some things to ponder and question. But she tied in things that were never 
maybe meant to be explored further in book number one, or maybe in her head she had these plots plotted out. So stay tuned because there is a nonfiction book, The Truth About Lisa Jewell, that I also picked up that was written while she was writing this book. So I'm excited to read that and then see what insights we might get into her. But I love her so much. This is such a fantastic book. I definitely would read The Family Upstairs first. I know you can like always read books independently, but I think a lot of things have a lot more oomph if you read The Family Upstairs first, but highly recommend it. Such a good book. And then another author that you guys know I love is Hannah Morrissey. This is book number three in the Black Harbor series. This is a book that you absolutely can walk into without having read the first two. So the Black Harbor series follows different dark murders in Black Harbor in Wisconsin. So it is a fictionalized town, but much like Dublin Murder Squad, the common theme is Black Harbor. And there is one character who does make appearances in all three books, but it is not necessary to read them in order to understand anything because each book is its own standalone case. So in this book, we are following a husband and wife who are a medical examiner and a police officer. And when the book opens, they are at the play of their high school daughter, Chloe, and they get called away because a teenager's body has been found. And it turns out that the body is her daughter's best friend and she has been murdered. So immediately they obviously are trying to find out what happened, but at the same time, they're worried about their daughter. And when they call her, to make sure she's okay, that she's left the play okay, that she's gotten home okay. She's not answering the phone and they can't find her. So we have a missing daughter, we have a murdered daughter, and we have them trying to both solve the case but also separate their personal feelings. So they are really much, they are really much, they are very much on both sides of the case for the first time. So instead of just being the ones investigating, they are also being investigated and they get to see what it's like when the tables turn. So Hannah Morrissey does such a great job of creating dark, atmospheric, cold, creepy. This takes place in and around Halloween. So it's a perfect seasonal read. Not that I want to tell you guys to wait till next October, but if you are someone who likes to read seasonally, but I obviously think you can pick it up at any point. There's a lot of suspects. There's a lot of questions about what's going on. She just has such a beautiful way of writing. It's very gritty and there's such like a coldness to it so much for the setting, but it's also really gut wrenching and heartbreaking and painful and so emotional in so many ways wrapped in this incredible murder mystery that's happening. So definitely on the dark and messed up side. Now you know why I love her. And I'm just such a fantastic fan. I'm a fantastic fan of hers. I'm a fantastic fan of hers. I'm such a big fan of hers. I keep saying that. I'm a fan of all of these authors. That should go without saying, but highly recommend this one. Loved it, love her. Can't wait to see what she does next because I believe her next book is a break from the Black Harbor series. So, but still gonna be crime fiction. Okay, a total turn for the lighter side. We have Happy Place by Emily Henry. And lighter, but still heavily emotional in so many ways. So this book follows a group of friends who are going away for an annual vacation in Maine that they have done every year since college. And as time has passed, relationships have changed and things have happened in their friend group dynamic. And the biggest thing is our main characters, Harriet and Wynn. So they met in college. They have been together for a long time. And what they have not told their friend group is that they have actually broken up. So in order to sort of keep the peace, they have decided to not tell their friends that they have broken up because they don't want to ruin this weekend. So originally Wynn was not supposed to come. He was sort of arm bent into it. So when they get there, they find out their friend Sabrina, whose family owns the cottage, is planning to marry her longtime boyfriend because her family is selling the cottage and they want to make this their last big hurrah at the cottage, have the ceremony, and have sort of best week ever with this group of friends. So that is really why Harriet and Wynne decide not to ruin everybody's week by saying, hey, by the way, we broke up. So in typical kind of rom com -y fashion, they wind up having to share the same room. They wind up having to kind of fake date in a way. And we get multiple timelines. So we get everything that's happening in the present day. And then we get flashbacks of how they met and kind of over and over again, the theme is that it's Harriet's happy place. 
and we see how their relationship developed we see why they broke up we see everything in between and we really get to see the dynamic between these friends again from when they met in college to where they are now and in a very different way but bear with me to the hunting party by lucy foley there is definitely a theme of some people not being able to see each other in a different way and sort of being locked into that impression of them in college and not being able to see the shifts in dynamics and there's some tension and as you grow up and you move away and you grow apart not being in each other's life every day there's a strain and a change there and how people are interpreting what's going on and assumptions that are made and also it is a complete getaway fun week where everybody just leans into having a good time. So there's some really great like friendship hijinks to this with going to the carnival and trying to relive some of their favorite moments from being at this cabin. And I have talked about this here before. So I went to school in Boston and me and a lot of my friends wound up staying there after we graduated. We used to get a house on the Cape every year and it would sort of be a little bit of a rotating group, but there was a core group of us who used to do it. So I felt a lot of sentimental attachment to this. And like I said, there are some heartbreaking moments to it. There's some mental health discussion in this, which I really related to. And I really felt connected to a lot of the writing in here, whether it was fears or insecurities that were being projected, whether again, it was that trying to recapture the dynamic between the group and have it be what it used to be. But I think Emily Henry has such a gift for capturing real emotion, for weaving together a story that is both humorous and heartbreaking. And I think her writing is tremendous. And I wound up listening to the audiobook of this, which Julia Whalen did. I had an audiobook arc of it from Libro FM, and it was so beautiful and so funny and so fantastic. So love her, love her, love her. Julia Whalen and Emily Henry. Okay, another person that I love. So I read The Fury by Alex Michaelides. This comes out in January 2024 in the US and February in the UK. So this is an arc that I got from Celadon. I didn't feel right putting it on my like best of the year list because it comes out next year. So you might see it in 2024, but I definitely wanted to shout it out because I loved the heck out of this book. So this is a group of friends on an island off of Greece and our main character Lana well she's sort of one of our main characters she is an ex-movie star she's kind of been a bit of a, re a recluse she wound up leaving the business a while ago she has a teenage son she is on her second marriage she's been very much out of the spotlight but she's one of the most famous women in the world and one of the most recognizable women and she is tired of rainy old London and she winds up inviting a group of her friends to spend Easter weekend on her island near Mykonos and that's what they go to do. So we are seeing this through the point of view of Elliot. He is a script writer, he, a playwright actually, and a friend of Lana's. And what we know at the beginning is that there has been a murder on the island and he is telling us this story and he's like, you've heard this story, but I'm gonna tell you what really happened kind of a thing. So we wind up getting multiple timelines and we see as this weekend unfolds and he does a fourth wall breaking in this, which I just love. I'm such a huge fan of that when it's done right. It's just so much fun. So it's meta, it's self-aware. He is telling us things, you know, like, I'm gonna drop a bomb, this is when this happens. And it's very much like in the Every One of My Family Has Killed Someone by Benjamin Stevenson vibe. And I just loved it. So I'm a huge fan of Alex Michaelides and I think his writing is great. It's super page churny. Lots of, lots of pages were dog-eared in this one. <laughs> but I swear no pages were harmed in the reading of this book. But I just thought it was really fantastic. His twists are great. He's got a couple Easter eggs to his previous books. And I just think he's a fantastic writer. So my pre-order of this will be coming in February because I did order the UK one. I was obsessed with the cover ding dong there it is but I'm super excited I had a chance to read this early so you'll be hearing more about this as 2024 unfolds okay another one of my dark and messed up favorite writers is Peter Swanson this is the kind worth saving this is the sequel to the kind worth killing and his new book coming out in 2024 a talent for murder also includes at least one character 
from these books, so I didn't read too much about it, but I will be pre-ordering it. I am a thousand percent waiting to see what the UK cover looks like before I pre-order it, but again, stay tuned for more about that. But to talk about The Kymer's Saving, so you guys know The Kymer's Killing is one of my all-time favorite thrillers. I have read it twice now. I kind of want to read it again. It doesn't get any less exciting when you know what happens. And we have two characters from the first book in this one. I don't want to say anything about anything because I feel like it's just, I don't want to take anything away from reading the first book. This is absolutely a case where I would say you have to read book number one, but also it will be one of the best reading experiences of your life, I think. <laughs> so it's well worth it. But this is a wholly new story, but we do have a lot of links back to the first book and this story and these characters will make much more slash different sense if you know what happened at book number one. So in this book, we are picking up I want to say like not quite a year later. A smart Audrey would have written that down somewhere, but Audrey is not always smart when she reads. So we do get a new character who is trying to find out if her husband is cheating on her. And she winds up hiring someone to help investigate her husband, kind of to prove that he's stepping out. And it just leads to all sorts of different dark messed up places. So we are still sort of in the in and around Boston area, which I love. And I just love Peter Swanson. So fantastic, fantastic. Okay, a new to me author. This is The Hurricane Blonde by Hallie Sutton. So I heard about this book from Kate and Gare on Killing the Tea podcast, which you guys have heard me talk about many times. They did an interview with her and I immediately picked up the book and the interview is fantastic by the way. So this is her second book. I did pick up her first book, but I haven't read it yet. It's up there. But in this one, we have kind of a true crime with a Hollywood vibe to it. So the line on the front of this one says, Hollywood loves a dead girl. She is always so photogenic. So we are following a woman named Selma. So she is part of a very famous Hollywood family. And 20 years ago, let me see, 20, 20, 20. So back in 1997, her older sister, Tawny, was found dead at her house by the pool. And the mystery was never quite solved. And this obviously has impacted her family and her and has led to so many questions. So all these years later, Selma's way of dealing with this is she is part of this true crime tour of famous dead actresses around Hollywood. And that tour culminates with going to her sister's mansion. And when the book opens, she is taking this group of, of tour guests to the mansion and a body of another woman who looks quite similar to her sister is found dead back by the pool. And we start to investigate what happened in the present, what happened in the past, is it connected? And we get some dual timelines in this one. This book is dark. I feel like that should go without saying, but this was way darker than I thought. And obviously in the best way. And so fascinating, the Hollywood side of it. So I will link the link <laughs> to Karen Kate's conversation with Hallie Sutton. But so much of the Hollywood side, there's a director who plays a big part in this. And the research that Hallie Sutton did, so much of this is based in fact of what fact, that was em emphasis, in fact of what directors actually did. And it's really just dark and disturbing in all the best ways. Okay, another bingeable book. This is The Block Party. This is by Jamie Day. This has a like arc cover on it. So this was sent to me by St. Martin's and this is kind of a rich people behaving badly in the suburbs, desperate housewives kind of a vibe to it. So the book opens at an annual block party in the suburban town and we basically know that somebody is dead and then we we fast forward. We rewind we rewind to the block party the year before and we re-meet all of the characters and start to piece together what went wrong, what happened, who could be dead, who could have done it. And this was one of those books where like anybody could have been murdered and anyone could have been the murderer and I would have been wholly satisfied because everyone in this book is just deliciously dark and messed up. So I loved it, loved it. Another book by a new to me author, but not a new author is The Celebrants by Stephen Rowley. So he narrated this audiobook himself. It was so beautifully well done. This is another book about a group of friends who met in college and they are 
meeting up again in present day. So kind of a big chill for the Gen X generation is what this is pitched as. So they are meeting up and they are all sort of on the cusp of 50. And when we had originally met them, they were seniors in college. They all went to Berkeley and one of the friends in their group died unexpectedly and they attend his funeral and they decide in that moment that they are going to do living funerals for one another whenever anyone needs it because what they don't want to have happen is have anything left unsaid, anyone not know how much they are loved by this group, how amazing they are. So we wind up following them through each character's living funeral and they have gathered together in the present day for the final living funeral. So we get to see how their relationships change. We get to see the dynamic between them. This is very heartbreaking. This is very funny. The audiobook again was tremendous. There's great wit to this. If you are of the Gen X generation, I think you will really appreciate the pop culture references he makes, just sort of like the language and the, t like the turn of phrase that he has. It's very relatable and he's fantastic. So I'm excited to read more of his books. And then I have two final books from two authors that I love. So the first one is Mae Cobb's A Likeable Woman. So I have read everything except her debut, which I do have, I was gonna say upstairs, up top, but I have read her more recent thrillers. I had to search high and low to get that one, but anyway, story for a different day. So in this one, we have returned to Texas and kind of similarly, we get an old group of friends reuniting. So these are friends from a small town from high school and our main character is drawn back for a marriage recommitment ceremony from a former best friend of hers from high school. But she has been gone from town for a long time. So Kira, who was named after Olivia Newton-John's character in Xanadu, which I just love, 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 is returning because her mom died when she was younger and she never quite recovered from that. She never really believed the stories she was told about what happened to her mother. And her grandmother is kind of luring her back now to come to this marriage recommitment ceremony and promising her that she will give her kind of the truth about her mother. So we wind up seeing dual timelines. The character of her mom is so fantastic and her mom's name is Sadie. And Sadie just has such an interesting story. She's such a strong woman. I found so much, again, relatability to what's happening in these books and a lot of the commentary and, you know, the idea of what it means to be a likable woman. So I really enjoy May Cobb's writing. I'm excited to see what she explores next, but she does also kind of similarly rich people behaving badly, desperate housewife vibes but different than The Block Party, but I love her. And then my final book is Lisa Jewell's None of This Is True. This was her 2023 release. This is a podcaster, I was gonna say true crime podcaster. She's a podcaster who is looking for a new story to tell. So Alex is out at a restaurant. She is celebrating her 45th birthday. She is our podcast host. And she meets this woman, Josie, who is also out with her husband celebrating her 45th birthday. So birthday twins. And Alex is on the lookout for a new podcast topic. Josie winds up pitching to her, sort of not right there at the restaurant, but gets inspired by it. The idea to follow a woman who is about to epically change her life and to document this through the podcast. So Alex agrees. She's intrigued by Josie and her life and her background. And Josie is very enamored of Alex and her husband and their children and their wealthy lifestyle. And we see how these women's lives intertwine and you can guess it's going to go in some dark and messed up ways. So I really enjoyed the podcast element of this. I physically read this. I imagine the audio is probably fantastic, just given the mixed media in this. And I just love the way this book was, like how the story was told, how it was laid out, how the reveals were done. And I just think Lisa Jewell is such a smart storyteller. I already said that with her earlier book, but I thought this was fantastic and I loved it and I will read anything she writes. She's an autobi author of mine. She's also someone I'm trying to read to zero, which I have told you guys so many times and one of these days I'm gonna get you a video on it. So that said, those were my, oh God, I loved you, I loved you, I loved you. I had to talk about you books from 2023. So again, not surprising. A lot of these were new releases of this year, but I just, 
I had to scream about them. So let me know what were some of your favorites that maybe didn't make your top tier list, but that you love so much that you still recommend them to everybody that you know and love. So that's gonna do it for this video. Stay tuned for my favorites of the year, which is coming up next. And until then, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.